Hey there, chess family. It's Grandma Smaxillingworth here, and I'm going to show you how Bobby Fischer destroyed the Scandinavian defense in a game at the Chess Olympiad against Karl Robach from Austria. So let's get straight into the game. If you've ever wondered after d5, ed5, queen d5, knight c3, and queen d8, what to do when they play the kingside fianchetto setup? Well, this game is an absolute model for how to deal with it. Now, after d4, black played the move g6 here, with the ideas of just pl building a nice solid home for his king. And already, I'll challenge you to see if you can find the move that Fischer played here as white. Because there are a lot of decent moves, but I think Fischer's is the best of all. So... Pause the video if you need more time to think about it. And once you've made your decision, I will show you the move that Fischer played. He didn't play the automatic knight to f3, which would be the standard move. But instead he played bishop to f4. With the idea that after bishop g7, he now played the move queen to d2. Basically just not caring about this pawn, saying to black, Okay, you can take the bait if you want. Uh, Black decided not to take the pawn in the game. Uh, he played knight f6 instead. But what if he does take the pawn? If he plays bishop d4, then what would you play then as white? Yeah, exactly. We castle long using that open d file in our lead in development. And after knight c6, we can increase the pressure on the pinned bishop with another pin, bishop b5. And after bishop to d7, white has quite a few compelling moves here, where you can either play knight f3 and hit the bishop this way, or you can go knight d5 first, hitting this pawn. And then after e5, we actually don't have to move the bishop away. Instead, just knight f3 and of all these pieces flooding into the attack, it's clear the black king is on the way to being drawn and quartered. On the other hand, if they play queen takes d4, at least it doesn't just lose on the spot the way that bishop d4 did. But still after queen d4 and bishop d4, white does have a pretty strong attack. In fact, can you actually improve on the annotator's move of knight b5 in this position? Let's see if you are, are all paying attention here. Yeah, well done. Knight to d5 is stronger than knight b5 because, well, it means I don't have knight a6 to defend that pawn as you can remove the defender with bishop takes a6. But if bishop b6, we can now play not knight takes c7, though that's also good for white, but rather bishop takes c7, threatening to take on b6 either way to win a pawn and obtain a very clear advantage. So I think that knight f6 might be the best move, but it kind of admits to, it, Black is admitting that his plan didn't really succeed because white castled long and is now ready to go for this attack with bishop h6 and some standard attacking ideas that the advanced viewers will know already, but I don't want to spoil the fun for everybody just yet. In this position, maybe it's best for Black just to play castles and just allow bishop h6. But I can sort of understand why black didn't play this way. Because it's not that easy to challenge a d-pawn. If knight c6 and d5 tends to be a strong reply. Whereas a move c6 will actually transpose to the game. So maybe black should have played a move like a6. And you know stopping knight b5. And trying to get the queenside pieces developed. It's a typical idea to delay castling when you know bishop h6 is coming to try and take some of the sting out of the attack. Though honestly bishop h6 is still a pretty decent move. And other natural developing moves should also be quite good for white here. So black's opening was clearly not the best. But after black's move c6 and then bishop h6. I mean it's one thing to get a good position and it's another to know how to win it. Probably black should have played bishop takes h6 and then bishop e6. Though his position would still be rather unenviable. 
why I would get a strong attack with normal developing moves. But after castles, this is just waving a red flag at a bull. So you know the first step of the attack against the Fianchetto castling position to play bishop h6 with the idea of eventually trading with bishops. But what's step two? Who can coach the coach here? So with white to move, the move that is the best is I think the move Fisher played, which is pawn to h4, where we use the e g6 pawn as a hook for the h pawn, where we will play h5 and trade this pawn in order to open up the h file for our rook. Because for the attack to be successful, we do need an open line to their king. And h4, h5 just fits the bill here. Black played queen to a5 in the game. Somewhat amusingly, the computer actually wants to go e5 and just give up a full pawn for nothing here. Which I find as a somewhat amusing uh, indication of how desperate black's position has become after just 9 moves. And it's also a good counter to the argument that, oh, opening theory is not really important. You just follow the general principles and get a good game. But that's not really that true if we look at this game. Because black just played normal developing moves. But because he played too passively and didn't fight for the initiative, now he's actually coming under a decisive attack after queen a5. Well, I was about to give away the next move, but let's work your brains. Uh, so... What would you play here as white? Yeah, you could play bishop g7. It's a perfectly good move. There are other moves that are also far from silly. But the move that's the most thematic is h5. And I realize it is a pawn sacrifice, but black would have to be very cold-blooded to take this pawn. Actually, in the game, he played g takes h5, which you know, looks a little bit ugly to weaken the king like this. But black was already in trouble here. Because if you play bishop h6, you're just helping the queen come into the attack for free. But if you play knight takes h5 instead, then... Well, it's very easy to play bishop e2 and just threaten to completely destroy the black pawn structure in this way. And if you retreat with knight f6 to avoid the doubling of the pawns, well, then you get a very standard attack with bishop g7. Well, let's play the moves together. So queen h6... King g8. And there are various moves that win for white. If you're relatively new to seeing how these h-file attacks work, say it's the first time you're seeing it, then it's probably a good moment to pause the video and decide what move you'd play. For the rest of you, I can point out that there are many winning moves. Knight f3 to g5 will destroy the defense of h7 very quickly. The same is true for g4, g5. And even the direct knight e4. They might be different moves, but they all have the same idea of where is the weakness. It's a pawn h7. The one piece defending it is a nine f6. So let's just get that knight out of the way so we can destroy black's king and, well, make it home in time for the football game. So the game continued g takes h5. And when they play moves like g h5, we shouldn't just try to refute them instantly. But we can just rely on the long-term weakness around Black's king. And the fact that Black's not really in time to create counterplay of his own. To steadily build up the attack. Bishop d3. And make sure all the pieces are involved in the attack. It's true, rook e1 was also quite good. The ideas of swinging the rook over into the attack with a rook lift. You know, in a winning position there are often a lot of good moves. As Fisher himself once said. Now, Black played knight b to d7. To be honest, I don't think he really has a much better move. Fisher played knight g2. I mean, you could argue knight f3 is a bit more active, but Fisher's move is also good enough to win. After rook d8, well, we have another puzzle for you, and again, there are a lot of good moves for white, but can you play like Fisher? Okay, so there are a lot of tempting options. I should say that bishop g7 and knight g3 ideas attacking the weaknesses this way should be good enough to win. The computer actually wants to play d5 here with the idea of cutting off the uh, the fifth rank. So you can get in the queen g5 move without the trade of queens. And that might be the most clinical of all. But Fisher's move is very thematic. 
in it, he wanted to force open the files to the enemy king. And he played this move of g4 to do that, with the point that if black plays knight g4, well, we can play either the immediate bishop g7 or first rook dg1. And black just doesn't have a good way to deal with the attack down the h file. If you take on h6, obviously after queen h6, black can't take that queen because there's a pin on the knight at the moment. And if you try, say, knight df6, trying to bring some peace to the defense. In the worst case, white can cash in with takes. And then the move f3, pinning and winning. And once we take the knight, black will have three pawns for the piece, but our big attack with all the pieces against the enemy king will ensure that the victory will be for whites. So in desperation, black played knight f8, trying to follow Ben Larson saying, with a knight on f8, there cannot be mates. But that wasn't really true in this game. So G takes h5. So White's achieved the aim of any attacking player when attacking the king. Open a file for our rooks for the to the enemy king. After knight e6. Next move is pretty obvious. Rook d to g1. Piling up on the weakness. Already it's a threat to take on g7 and slide our queen into h6 to attack g7 and also h7. Black played king to h8. Bishop g7, knight g7, and I kind of gave away the move here uh, already. So we play queen h6, bring queen into the attack with tempo. I mean, that's what the initiative is all about. It's about having this flow of threats that the opponent can't ignore. If they play knight e6, then there's only one piece covering the g7 square and queen g7 mate. So by that logic, knight f4 is a pretty easy way to destroy the defense and cash out the victory. In the game, black played rook g8. And at this point, there are a lot of ways for white to win. And this is kind of icing on the cake here. So we had rook g5. Knight f4 and knight g6 is also crushing, by the way. Queen d8. And after rook h to g1. Here, black got a bit desperate and played knight f5. And after a simple bishop f5. Well, white is winning at least a piece, so black just resigned here. Uh, you know, even if bishop f5. I mean, in the worst case, you can play rook f5, since the rook's defended. And after bishop f5, rook g8 is even better, actually. But if they go queen f8, I have one final puzzle for you before we conclude the lesson. So what would you play here if you were white in this position? And yeah, I know there are a lot of winning moves for white, but what's the most winning move to give black no chance of pulling off a Smyrden-esque swindle? Okay, if you wanted to play knight d1 with the idea of bringing the knight into the attack this way, it should be good enough to win. Uh, so there are some other knight moves that are also appealing, like knight e4, for example. But the most clinical is to play the move d5. That way we don't even let their bishop or knight get to a good square. If they take, then the knight comes in and destroys the defense here. But if they play a more solid move like bishop d7, well, now we have a nice little tactic and... Okay, lots of moves are winning, but the most clinical is to use our d-pawn as a battering ram with d6, overloading the defense of the knight on f6. The problem for black is if you play some waiting move like rook e8, white will take e7, and one of the knights will fall. If rook e7, you can win the knight with queen f6. And if queen e7, white has rook takes g7, and soon a checkmate will follow on the h7 square if black doesn't resign first. So a pretty crushing example by Fisher, wouldn't you agree? And now you can see how to deal with this g6 setup. Just go for opposite side castling, get your bishop to h6 with the queen bishop battery, go ahead with h4, h5, and then the attack almost plays itself. Just play like Bobby Fischer. So do let me know in the comments what you learned from this game, and very much appreciate if you can show your appreciation for this mini lesson by liking and maybe even subscribing to this channel. So thanks for your attention being a great student, and I'll see you in the next Grandmaster video.
This is Grandma Smack saying worth signing out.